Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. First John chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, those that are saved, that we should be called the sons of God. There's the promise again. Paul spoke about we are the children of God by Jesus Christ. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knoweth him not. So, we have no relationship with the world, because the world does not know God. Our relationship broke with the world when we became newborn in Christ, became the family of God, children of God, calling him Abba Father. The world can't do that. No matter how much they come up and say, well, God, Father, and all that, and we're of God too. If they're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no relationship. If they don't have the Spirit of God, they're none of His, the Father's. Beloved, how are, you know, beloved, and John was called the beloved disciple. Now look how he takes that word and applies it to the Christian. And then God says, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. Takes that beloved and passes it on to us, and that beloved comes by only Jesus Christ. Now are we the sons of God? Now. Now. It's not, that's not something that comes later. That's not like the crowns that come later. Right now, and even our sinning state, we are the sons of God. Philippians 3.21 And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Alright? But we know that. We know that. We know. That's what separates us from religion. I know. But I don't know what I'm going to appear as. <laughs> it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, coming to Jesus Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's the rapture. That moment when the church, the dead, and those that are alive are caught up in the clouds. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the next, we see Jesus Christ, the blessed hope. We will finally see who Jesus Christ looks like. He says, for we shall see him as he is. Remember who's writing this. This is John the Beloved. This is the one that saw Jesus resurrected. This is the one that saw Jesus carried up into the into the heavens to the Father, the right hand. And maybe he's, he's saying to us that there's going to be even more beauty of Jesus Christ than what he saw. And every man that has this hope in him purify himself. What's the hope? Jesus is coming for me. I'm going to see him. I'm saved. I know it. And I'm going to be like him. So I better darn well put my sins under the blood, 1 John 1, 9. I better live right. Because he's coming. And if he doesn't come in my lifetime, I better not die with a cigarette in my mouth. I better not die laying in a bed of a woman that's not mine. I better not have a Budweiser in my mouth. I better be clean. Because whatever moment God calls me, or whether rapture or death, when God calls you, I'm going to stand before him. Listen, if, if, if the rapture is not during my lifetime, 
my grandma always thought it was going to be during her life. It wasn't, sorry to say. But it will be in her time. But if the Lord does not come in my lifetime, I don't know when I'm going to die, and I don't know what kind of condition I'm going to be dead. I'm not going to be known how to be found in my dead state if the Lord tarries. It better be clean. It better be right. It better not be like demons giving up. Because the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I, I know I know a well preacher in Florida he used to use this as an illustration, but can you imagine taking a drag of a cigarette and then next thing you know, you're dead and you you blow and you, I know it's not gonna happen, but you were caught. So the fact is that if we really believe Jesus is coming, we're gonna purify ourselves. We're not gonna be listen, what child would have their mother walk in the kitchen and then put his hand in the cookie jar to steal the cookie? No. You you look for your parent. Are they coming? Oh, I don't see him. All right, now let's do the dirty deed. Even as he is pure, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. That law was to show me how wicked I was. I can't do it. I can never say I'm sinless, perfection of my own merit. For sin is the transgression of the law. The law defined what sin was. Thanks to the law of sin, the wages of sin is death. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. So what do you do when somebody says, well, I'm relying on my baptism for salvation. I'm relying on uh, fee fi full foam churn cakes into Jesus as my means of salvation. Selling magazines, getting married, uh, being a member of a particular church. That's my entrance into heaven. And we know that he was manifested. He was made known to take away our sins. And him is no sin. And as we re read about in Hebrews, no man can take away your sin because man's a sinner. He can't take away what he has of what you have, the common denominator of sin. In order to have your sin removed by someone else, that person has to be sinless. And Jesus Christ fulfilled that. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Well, look at that. I abide in Christ. I don't sin. Whosoever, and whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither knows him. Well, when I sin, I take my eyes off him and I neglect Jesus Christ and not deny him. Because if I was really thinking about Jesus Christ, I would not be sinning. I'd be like, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. And yet, in the state that I am, that my body has been spiritually circumcised from my flesh, this flesh sins, but my soul and spirit doesn't sin. And this body will be put to destruction if the rapture tarries. It will get its just reserves in the grave. It'll be decayed, eaten up bugs and all that. That's what sin gets. That's what this sin does to us. Because had not been sin, we, we'd be able to go talk to Adam today. So, you can't say that I keep God and Jesus Christ on our mind all the time. I can't say that. Because I sin. I'm a sinner. I've taken my eyes off God. The first commandment is God first all the time. You know why that first commandment is that? Because if we kept God in our thoughts, in our mind, in our heart, and loved him with all our soul, as we should, we would not sin. Commandments 2, 3 to 10, that's just remind us what sins we do. Little children. Again, there's that spiritual ages. Let no man deceive you. Deceiving. Look, look, at, look at that. Look how many times deceiving. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous. So the righteousness that we do is Christ's righteousness and not of our own. And we do it because we love him. 
He that committeth sin is of the devil. John 8, 44. But God is our Father. For the devil sinned from the beginning. Match that with John 8, 44. He's also a liar. He's also a murderer. He also sinned. The foundation of sin came through Satan. When iniquity was found in him. So all that came from Satan. Had he not deceived Eve. Let's say for whatever reason. Let's say Eve did, denied. Or didn't listen to. Called upon God. He would be still the sinner. And we would be the righteous today. He would be still going to hell. In the lake of fire. Probably trying to destroy man. All through whatever time God would add. But sin lies in the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, that's sin. So a moment that I sin, I go back to my old nature, my old father, and start taking up his deeds. The moment I go back to the world, I'm taking up Satan's domain. I've left God my father, which is impossible for him to leave me, but I've left him and gone to serve my other daddy. How do you think that pleases God? With all the love that he's shown us and all the destruction that our sinful father, and we go back to him in our sins, our flesh. That's why the spirit lusts against the flesh. It's God and Satan battle it out in your body to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. Christ destroyed the works, the sin, upon the cross. He grabbed the keys of death and hell. Those things that Satan had the domain over, Christ has now the domain. Whoso is born of God. All right, are you born again? Are you saved? Have you received that new birth? Does not commit sin. So verse 8. That's not us. That's man in his old nature. Who has not been born again. Because verse 9. Who has been born of God. Born, born again. Does not commit sin. You say well. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just. Yes, that part of us that's been circumcised, that has been kicked out of our soul and spirit, that does sin, this flesh that we are supposed to get the victory over. But truly in the eyes of God, there are no sinners. They are born of Him. And once this body has been given the new body, the new hope, after the judgment seat of Christ, then we're forever we're never going to sin. Ever again, even with a new body. For his seed remaineth in him, God's seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This is the new nature versus the old nature. Romans 7 1 through 8. The new nature in me, I can't sin. So you see where chapter 1 people say, Well, I don't sin. Yes, you do. In the flesh. You put this flesh in the grave, dead, you will definitely won't sin. Never again. You put this, this flesh under a new body, and you won't sin. But as children of God, yes, he does not see a sin. And when Satan goes before God, he says, well, you see, Styler, you see what he's doing? Well, Father, he's, he's our child. He's put it under the blood. And God says, I don't see no sin. That's my son. That's my son. He don't sin. And I'm clean. I'm in the family by the Holy Spirit, by the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the Calvary's cross. The empty tomb. So it's so much and then just, you know, it, it's so much to salvation. That not only the blood, blood atonement, which is necessary to be saved, 
You must be born again. The, the position that God has put us in. You talk about royalty. I am a child of the one that created everything. And then my position in heaven will be equal that to the angels. In this, the children of God are manifested. Everything is manifest in this chapter. And the children of the devil, whoso do, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And we saw that again. So one that's child of God. He does not do righteousness. What is righteousness in the eyes of God? Jesus Christ. Don't come to me and, and say, if you do not have Jesus Christ, you bring me whatever you, what you're trusting. Or what you're not trusting. I don't believe in heaven or hell. Or I believe we come back as something else. Or I got this. Whatever it is. If it's not Jesus Christ or righteousness, then you are of Satan. And in the eyes of God, you are unrighteous. You say, Stalin, then how are you going to heaven? By Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. That's it. Well, what did you do? I did absolutely nothing. Matter of fact, you know what I did? Which I didn't do because it wasn't me. I was born as a sinner. Salvation has nothing to do with me. It was God that wrote the book. It was God that sent the Holy Spirit into my heart to convict me of sin. And it was God call, using me to call upon Jesus Christ to save my miserable soul. And then after that, it was the Holy Spirit that came and dwelt in me, made me the family of God, that God is my Father, and has planted to me a mansion, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, a child of the King, possibly crowned, possible inheritance, and to be righteous. And I didn't do anything for it. It is never on my, on my merit, not of works, at least any man should boast. But if anything but Jesus Christ, you're unrighteous in the eyes of God, and you're of Satan. And it's funny how, because we're going to get in this cane here. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, he that loveth not his brother, we, we talked about in chapter 2. If you can't love your brother in the Lord, and brother means if we are the children of God, then we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. You can't love him. And as the Bible says, you say you love God, which you've never seen God. And that person you've seen, that's not correct. That's not right. There is no righteousness in that of hating one of another. You need to get that right. You need to get it confessed. You need to get it back to love. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, Satan, who slew his brother. Well, see, he hated his brother. Then Cain envy, and then came there in the field one day, and however it happened, Cain killed his brother Abel. That's what hating your brother will do to you. You let it go and you feed it and let Satan take care of it, it will result in death. Not as Cain that was of that wicked one. Now some will say, you know, Cain and Eve had a relationship. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the devil and Eve had a relationship and produced Cain. You go back and says she knew Adam and bared Cain. That's the number one reason right there. Uh, and verse 10 in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. So that would mean the devil's had all kinds of relationships. You would kick me in the face and knock me down and shoot me with a forty-five if I dared to say your mother and Satan had a relationship together. Would that be? Would that be proper to say? If I walked up to you and said your mom and Satan, and well. You turn around and say, well, Eve and, and Satan had a relationship and brought forth Cain. See, with scripture with scripture, you take a foolish statement and it makes it even foolisher when you apply it to real life. Slew his brother because he hated him. Why did he hate him? 
Because Cain, I mean, Abel is righteous. Abel is righteous. Abel was righteous. Verse 10. And Cain wasn't. Verse 10. Cain followed the way of the devil. Verse 10. Abel followed the way of righteousness. Verse 10. Abel did that was right in the eyes of God. Verse 10. Cain did not do that was right. Verse 10. So today, what is right in God's eyes? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What is anything else? Well, anything you want to do, but Jesus Christ. So righteousness, according to Cain and Abel, is doing what God told you to do. The unrighteousness is doing it your own way, and Cain offered his own fruits of his own hands. That's religion. And wherefore he slew him? Because his own works... What was his own works? Didn't he offer vegetables? Cain, I mean, Abel offered blood. Didn't he feed that sheep and brush that sheep and shear that sheep? And he was told, they were both told from Adam and maybe from God, we don't know, but there was an offering of blood, not vegetables. You see, all those vegetables and fruits that Cain offered was everything that he done. He controlled how much water. He controlled how much sunlight. He controlled which plants would survive, which plants he would pull. He, he decided which fruit he was going to pick and what fruit he wasn't going to pick. Cain is the master of his garden. All Abel could do is look at that sheep and say, Lord, is that the one? I want to make sure that's the one. He couldn't make that sheep cleaner. He couldn't make that sheep uh, healthier. And then it had to be blood. That offering had to be blood, verse 10. So a righteous man will bring blood to God. That blood is the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of God, Acts 20, 28. An unrighteous man will bring the fruit of his hands. Dirt. Dirt was cursed in Genesis chapter 3. So Cain already started off wrong by bringing something that was cursed to God. Here, God. And his brothers righteous. Verse 10. So we see what the verse 10. Now we see by illustration. We see loving not his brother. Verse 10. We see it in illustration of Cain and Abel. It's doing what God said to do and it's not doing what God said to do. And the results thereof. And the Bible says that Abel's blood cries out. God wants blood and God wants righteousness. Don't listen to my brother. Don't trust my brother. Marvel not, my brethren, say people, if the world hates you. So if the world comes up to you and hates you, don't marvel. It's supposed to hate you. Because you are right in God and they are not. They are convicted by the Holy Spirit. They are angry as Cain was angry because God did not take what he had to offer. God should have done what I did brought him god should have been pleased it was me and god's not jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no man comes unto the father but by me and man in the world hates that one way of god see in the, in the eyes of the world we, we've seen this the last couple of weeks is, is all the world is supposed to be saved no jesus said it's the straight gate and few that go in the broad is the way that leads to destruction. So if the world loves you. You got to look at how you're living as a Christian. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life. So when we die, the Bible says, absent from that body and present with the Lord. Really, there's no death for a Christian. It's 
the moment of a twinkle in an eye or the twinkle, or, you know, the sparkle in the eye. Whatever death is for the Christian, if you're here and I, there's no time frame, then you're there. You may be looking at your family up from a hospital bed, and then next thing you know, you're looking at Jesus. You may be looking at that semi coming at you head on, next thing you know, you're seeing Jesus. You may close your eyes, get ready to go to bed, and, and just fall off to sleep, and open up your eyes, and there's Jesus. In actuality, really, minus this body, there's no death, because even for a lost man, it said he, he died, and they buried, and he lifted up his eyes in hell. But for us, there's no death, because we love the brethren. Look at that love there. We go from death to life by loving the brethren. It's important. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You say, well, how can that happen? I'm not going to die because I... No, you know it's not. If you die and you hate people, brethren, your family in the Lord God... You're going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ as a lost. And any loss that you have that turns in ashes to God, that's death. Where you could have a free crown given to you. That the crowns that are to be lost is our own stupidity. It's our own sin. It's our own fault. It is never God's fault for the loss that a man will get at any judgment. It's because we would not do what God said to do. And God's telling us, love the brethren. You love the brethren, you'll help the brethren. We're going to see in a moment. You, you'll take care of the brethren. You'll have fellowship with the brethren. And that will get you rewards. That will get you pleasing God. He that loveth not his brother, biteth in death. You're, as far as God's eye is concerned, I could be witnessing. and I could be reading my Bible. I could be singing. I could be doing all. And God says, you're just dead. You're a Christian zombie. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Cain. Cain put it in action. And hatred so strong that you could actually come up with the thoughts of killing somebody. A Christian brother. Those priests that, that God made to set up as the Levitical priesthood of that temple brought Jesus Christ to Pilate because of envy because they hated him all through the life they, they're we, we got together how can we kill how can we uh you know catch him in his words and you can resort to that you gotta get rid of anger because anger will turn into bitterness I, I had that one time in my life with a Christian and that, that took it took much prayer. It took and it finally just I don't remember how I don't, it went when, but the Lord, you know, I, I I prayed for the person. I don't have that hatred anymore. And what that guy done, I, just leave it in the Lord's hand. But it's very hard. I suffered through that one time. And he know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's interesting, because it said that, you know, if a man confesses sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. And right here, a murderer has no eternal life. Well, then the Bible is contradictory. It, it, it implies the fact is that if you die with that hatred of the brother, the charge of murder, and you didn't kill him, What kind of eternal life really would it be for you in heaven if you lose your rewards? You lose a millennial inheritance. When it comes time to cast our crowns before the Lord, you ain't got any. Why? Because you hated Tom, Dick, or Harry. Was really hating that Christian really worth it? Will it be worth it?
It's not that you are going to, you know, lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. But you can lose rewards as a Christian. No matter how much you can do, if there is hatred in your heart for a brother in the Lord, a sister in the Lord, you lost. It says in, in Corinthians, I forget to about the judgment seat of Christ. Your works will be put to the fire, but you will not be. And you will suffer loss. Hereby we perceive we the love of God. Now this is what the love is. Because he laid down his life for us. We know that. Because look what he said. Is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. All right. A murderer who has never trusted Christ is not saved. He's in his sins, he's going to die in his sins, and he's going to go to the lake of fire. Because he has not believed on Jesus Christ. Hereby we precede we the love of God. Going straight into, now we're going to, all right, this is what the love of God is. <coughs> because he laid down his life for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the love of God. And people are stupid. They'll come up to it. Well, you don't preach love. Yes, I am. I'm preaching Jesus Christ. That is the love of God. Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ ever hate anybody? No. But he did get angry with them. He did sigh in the spirit over some of them. He groaned in the spirit over a few of them. That's different from hating. Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. There's that love again of the brethren. Now it's remarkable because in Ephesians 5.25 we see this command for the husbands too. You're to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Is that interesting? The love of God is what will you sacrifice for your wife, for the church members. But whosoever has this world's good, whatever this world has, money, food, whatever, and seeth his brother. Now, First John are saved people. His brother have a need. What, it doesn't even say what the need is. It doesn't say what you have. But there's a need. And it's implying that what he needs, you have. And shut of up, shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? All right, let's say you, you've got a, a fellow Christian in church, and they're, they're having funny trouble with, with the bills and all that, and they're having a problem with groceries. Or maybe medical bills. That's a big one. One of the people in, in their house ends up in the hospital and they, and they don't have any money. Or they're going to have limited money. You got an extra $50. I didn't say 5000 I didn't say $5 million. I didn't say 100 I said just by chance God is giving you $50 extra. Your, your bills are paid. You got $50 extra. And you say, you know what? I can use this for my family. You know what? That brother needs help. I don't know what he can do with it, but I'm going to give it to him. Maybe, you know, I don't want anybody to know. Church treasurer, give this to this person. Don't tell him who it is. Or, you know, you shake his hand. You put it in. However you do. But you give him the $50 that God's given you extra. Somehow you've helped him. You have aided in loving your brother. By giving. You know, it doesn't mean you have to go up and put your arm around him and kiss him and hug him. Loving the brethren, it could be the simple is praying for them. They're in serious trouble. They're they're confused. So you pray for them. I got I got people in my Bible. My prayer, my Bible is also my prayer book. And I'll come across the names. And, you know, I really don't. I don't like what that person did to me. I'll still pray for them. 
I've got people done things to me. I cross out their name, and God's so funny. He's like, no matter how much I cross it out, their name still comes out. Okay, Lord, you know, that's that was two or three years ago. I pray for him. I pray for him. That's where it stands. Later on, when they have a need, what will you do with that need? I can imagine Abel would have gave Cain anything that Cain would have asked for to please God. I don't think Abel would have been stiff. I don't think he would not get out of here, Cain. I'm having a good time in the Lord. A Christian is giving. And as I said before, you know, you may not, the person may be irritated to you. That's what happens with some human beings. You're just opposite. Whatever it is. But hatred's so strong. Hatred's, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to pray for you. I don't want to help you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Or it could be just, you know, I don't even know who you are. There are people in my church, I don't even know who they are. And I hear their name. I pray for them. I don't even know who they are. I don't hate them. Just, I'm terrible with names. I'm terrible with people. But the thing, oh, that person, you know? No, don't be like that. You don't have the Spirit of God in you. You don't want bitterness. Help anybody you can. Whatever God's given you, it doesn't have to be money. Whatever the good you've, you've gotten of the world, and you see that he has a need, if you can meet that need, help. And you'll be rewarded by that brother and by God. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that goes back to verse 17. You know, there was somewhere else in the Bible that said, you know, the person had a need, well, go and be filled. And that's, that doesn't do you no good. I, I need some money for food. Uh, my favorite. Well, you go and be full, and, and God bless you. You're not giving me anything. No, just go be filled. Well, ain't going to do you no good. Love indeed, and this goes with James with faith and works. Don't just talk it. Do it. Be ye doers of the word. Christ helped. He fed people. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So helping the brethren in the church on whatever way you can do, that also establishes our hearts. Say, oh, I, I don't know if I'm really saved. I, I don't know if I can lose it. What is your attitude to the brethren in the church? Go and check that. How are you to the church brethren? Are you a giver or are you a taker? That can be the difference. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and assure our hearts before him, God. By what? By doing the word of God. For if our heart condemned us, God is greater than our hearts, heart and knoweth all things. But beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. It's an heart issue. And if your heart does right to your brother in the Lord, God will aid and grow you. And when your heart does condemn you, and you go to God and confess those sins, God will rejoice and give you confidence and give you the blessing but if you're hating somebody in the church or hating somebody who's saved God has got a deaf ear to you beloved if our heart condemns us not then we have confidence towards God and whatsoever we ask we receive of him God because we kept his commandments what's the command what's John the Torah loving the brethren and Jesus said that. So, if you're asking for God for things, and you really think they're good things, and they're not for lustful things, and your prayers are not being answered, how are you treating the brethren? Hmm. 
That's important. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because he, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do. Faith and works. What is pleasing in his sight? We confess our sins. We treat the brethren right. There is no hatred. There is no murdering. Love. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. All right. Those who believe on Jesus Christ got the new birth. That's what they've done. I've done that. Check it off. And love one another. As he, Jesus, gave us commandment. How are you doing with the brethren? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Can't stand that person over there. Don't sing. Don't do anything for the Lord because you're not pleasing him. The Bible told you go to that person and get it right. Gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, loving the brethren. So don't even go that avenue. When you start seeing that, that a brother in the Lord starts irritating you, get it dealt with God right away. Plead to God. Get it right. Don't even let that bitterness get in there. Don't even let that anger get in there. Start pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, most times it may be just because you're own, your own stupidity. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, God, and he in him. And hereby we know that, we, that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Oh, that's the same person. Because the Holy Spirit goes into those that are saved and abideth in us. God... Because chapter 2 has been about God, 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 God. Hereby we know that he, God, abideth in us. Wait a minute, I thought the Holy Spirit abided in us. He does. I thought I read somewhere and studied that we, before we read that Christ indwells in me. He does. And so does God. He dwells in us. Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, they indwell in a Christian are there three different compartments in my heart? No, there are one. So, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are one. Again, there's that trinity we're going to see in chapter 5. Lord willing. But let's put hate away. I said, there's irritation. There will be times when you get mad. Two brothers will get mad. And it happens. But don't let it go. The Bible says, Paul wrote, be angry and sin not. So, on what we learned tonight, I can be angry at a brother in the Lord or a sister in the Lord. What is Paul's answer to 1 John? Where John says, don't you hate him. Be angry. As far as what John has written us today, do not hate him. Help them. Don't let hate get in. Because hate is never of God. It's of Satan. And we're going to read next chapter, Lord willing, God is love. Sometimes you just got to forgive and forget. Sometimes you got to see that maybe you're at wrong. Most of the time it's, it's us. Get over it. That's all I can say. Plead the blood.